afraid my, uh, my German isn't as, uh, as good as the last speaker. So I'll be presenting in English. Um, but as a, a digital expert who came to the world of, uh, of human rights, um, I think I've been lucky enough to see how uh, these worlds have, have come together and I guess to see how digital technologies have impacted not only the world of human rights but other industries as well, other sectors. Um, digital technologies have been described as offering us new ways to do old things. We still love to socialize, we still need to love, we still want to learn, we still need to express. But something else has also happened. The pace has increased and linearity is becoming slowly redundant. In practically every area of our lives, digital technologies have moved from the fringes into the, the very heart of how we operate, with associated outputs not simply being a channel to promote or to engage, but also being, I guess, the, the good or service itself, the very thing that we, we use. The resulting disruption in time-honored business models or societal or social models has precipitated seismic changes in the way that we, as human beings, are entertained, in the way that we are educated, the way we engage with others, the way we purchase, and so on. And with this new reality as a backdrop, I wanted to know, really, how does technology stand to impact our appreciation of, uh, I guess, our appreciation and understanding of human rights? So where are we right now? Well, predicting technology is almost as hard as trying to predict international affairs. Both try to take ideas from our past and turn them into ideals for the future. Some succeed whilst others mutate into something a world away from what was originally intended. Regardless of what you think of technology or the world around us, one thing is for sure. The future ain't what it used to be. Now, these changes have taken place in what seems like a short period of time to us. But we'd be wrong to think that we're beyond the formative years of technology and technological evolution as a whole. We're still too close to the inception of, of really the, the beginning of the digital revolution to know what the impacts will be in the long term. So just as few could have foreseen the impacts of... Uh, oops. So just as few could have foreseen how the, uh, the impacts of the introduction of the Gutenberg Press would have eventually have led to the Reformation, very few can really foresee how the introduction of the World Wide Web in 1989 will have an impact on our lives halfway through this century. Now, of course, what we do know and what we, we can appreciate is that everything that has happened to date, everything that, I guess, the, the changes that are happening before our eyes, we can appreciate that. And if you'll permit me to oversimplify just for a second, I think the, the human response to the digital revolution and the introduction of digital technologies can be, I guess, broken down into three loosely overlapping areas. The first, solitary, was defined by a detached experience of the internet. Invariably, this experience started and ended with an individual, be that a, an organization or a person. So the nature of communication mimicked that we were comfortable with, the idea of that one-to-one -one communication broadcast, if you like. One message uniformly and simultaneously distributed to many people at once, but received in solitude. Sharing, and by this I mean the reception, the evolution and redistribution of ideas, not simply discussing a one-to-many experience over the water cooler, was a rarity in this world. The second age, social, relied on the network effects of services like YouTube, like Twitter, Facebook. And this is where sharing as we now understand it, receiving, evolving, redistributing, came into being and came of age. Now, in this era, how we used digital technologies became less a reflection of who we were and more a reflection of who we wanted to be. At its simplest, social media can be described as the, the greatest expression of who we want to be the world has ever known. Now, ironically, 
this collective global exhalation of ideas and of, uh, of information has been so pronounced that it's, it's overshadowed to some degree the emergence of what I think has been a third and most exciting um, age, which is the societal age. Now, the societal age is where technology itself becomes a powerful, yet invisible, largely invisible enabler of solutions. Now, note it's about technology enabling a solution, not technology as the solution. Because it's not about the technology, it's about the necessity. And it's about ideas born out of that necessity. Urbanization necessitated new forms of transport and the car, like it or loathe it, enabled employment distribution as never before. An early example of technologies, third age, can be seen in the development of smart, smartphone applications. So if you like, there are millions of human challenges that have been solved thanks to the enabling power of these things. Now, as a result, more smartphones were sold last year than computers. And I'm talking about desktops, lap laptops, and tablets together. More smartphones were sold globally than all of those put together. And this, my friends, is where the, the transition gets really exciting in my mind. Uh, this transition from societal to, sorry, some, from social to societal. Um, I think the early 2010s will be remembered as the point at which we made that switch. And that's where things get really interesting. In our business, for want of a better term, the business of social change, digital technologies were once used as a mechanism solely to amplify the voice of civil society. Which gets back to that idea of broadcast I mentioned earlier. This gave way to their utilization as an engagement platform, slowly. Building links with new and existing supporters. However, as with other sectors before it, civil society is experiencing its technological third age, a quiet revolution, but one that is fundamentally changing the very essence of how organizations within it operate and how we achieve our objectives. So what does this mean for civil society? Well, let's look at the library. The library was once regarded as the citadel of all knowledge. Access was open, but it was conditional. There were set opening times. You had to be a member. You could only borrow a certain number of books at any one time. There were penalties for late returns. Now, of course, we no longer have that problem of scarcity of information. It's everywhere, and it's on demand. Like the library, civil society organizations are no longer the gatekeepers of all knowledge. Whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not, the contract between civil society and our supporters has changed. So take the electricity supplier, provides energy to end users. Um, we, I guess the electricity supplier wouldn't deign to tell the electricity user how to use that electricity. Um, it doesn't know or profess to know every possible permutation of that use of electricity. It doesn't make light bulbs. It doesn't make electric cars, for example. Um, but they know for sure that they want to make sure that you can use the electricity. And in the same way, civil society needs to accept that whilst these big ideas can captivate an audience, it may not always know the best use of its ideas, if you like. And particularly within a small and highly focused situation. So put simply, the, the role within civil society needs to move from that second age into the third age, where technology is characterized by that metamorphosis, metamorphosis into, from public service into public utility. Now this will be an age where active participation goes way beyond that we've ever known, and it's no big secret. We've seen a lot of that over the last 12 months. You might not be surprised to learn that I'm an incurable evangelist for technology, but I'd be the first to agree with Evgeny Morozov, the author of The Net Delusion, that we sometimes become distracted by the universal tendency to imagine technology as a liberating force. Technology alone is neither good nor bad. It remains neutral. It can be used to do either or both simultaneously. The electricity supply has very little control over this situation, for example. Now, things have been this way for some time and they're not about to change, as was demonstrated on the streets of London only last summer. 
with rioters, the police, citizens using technology to gain the upper hand. This caveat notwithstanding, the fact remains that the, the landscape in which we operate has changed and we owe it to rights holders everywhere to respond accordingly to that change. In fact, the risks of not doing so far outweigh the risks of doing so. And it's pertinent to think about it in these terms also, that it's not just non-state actors in the form of activist groups and organizations or state actors with different interpretations of, of freedom of expression that are in this space, but it's also individuals, the individual rights holder, the person we work for, the, uh, the human and human rights, if you will. In Amnesty's case, um, now these people have turned to technology out of necessity to invoke uh, the earlier theme. So how are we responding as Amnesty International? Well, earlier this year at the World Economic Forum, the Secretary General of Amnesty International, Salil Shetty, spoke of the innumerable ways in which technology within Amnesty can be used for good and how, too, it can enable ordinary people to achieve extraordinary change. Let's not forget that as an organization, we've been doing this since 1961, pulling geographically or functionally dispersed individuals together with common values or common ideas, pulling them together to do something. I'm not joking when I say that Amnesty International is one of the world's first social networks. I think it's worth remembering that the person who came up with the term social network, Professor J.A. Barnes, came up with that term in 1954. Um, Amnesty was born seven years after that. Um, his work was in relation to a, a Norwegian fishing village of all things. So this goes way beyond uh, you know, the, the internet construct that we now think of as social media, social networking. And I guess in our space, the key thing that Amnesty can do is to think about how technology can be used not just to solve millions of human challenges, but millions of human rights challenges, if you, if you like. So we wanted to know what would happen if we took a little bit of the way technology entrepreneurs say in Silicon Valley think and injected that into the jugular vein of the work that we do as human rights professionals. What if active participation meant rights holders being in a position to help define and solve their own problems through innovation? We needed to find out. So recently with uh, the work that IDEO, a global consultancy does uh, globally, we worked with this organization to to look at how technology might be used to design solutions for individuals who are in those situations that we want to look at. Often in these cases, um, within the case that we looked at, which was security with human rights and unlawful detention, you have individuals who are detained by uh, security forces who may not be given access to a lawyer, um, may not be charged or may even undergo torture. As we all know in this room, it's not about the guilt. It's not about the innocence, it's about whether these individuals have access to fundamental human rights or not. So six months ago, we took this problem to the masses. We went to 25,000 individuals within the Open IDEO community, who were based in 150 countries, presented the task to them of devising concepts that could help individuals who were impacted by unlawful detention. Now, in the Amnesty camp, there were researchers, campaigners, human rights defenders, um, individuals who had experienced unlawful detention themselves. In the IDEO camp, there were product designers, product strategists, uh, product strategists, sorry. And in the, uh, the community were thousands of individuals who, over the course of three months, turned a vague idea into 322 concepts, which were then boiled down into fewer than 10. So does anybody know what a hackathon is? Okay, let me tell you what a hackathon is. For those of you who don't know, a hackathon is literally a, a hacking marathon. It's where you take a, a technological challenge, um, you present it to a room full of computer programmers, you lock them in there for about two or three days, you feed them nothing more than pizza and energy drinks, with the hope that they will emerge with something magical. Now, geeks love a challenge. Geeks and techies love a challenge. And some of the tools that you now use today and love, know and love, um, were created at hackathons. So things like the Facebook like button, for example, um, the, uh, the Facebook timeline, a lot of Google tools were created at hackathons. A lot of these things were created over the course of 24, 48 hours. 
Um, now, last month, we joint hosted a hackathon with IDEO. Um, it was, if you like, a higher grade of, of hackathon because we, we work in human rights. So we wanted to give them a balanced diet, as you can see up there. And uh, we let them come and go as they please. We didn't lock them in the room. Um, but I've been to a few hackathons, and I, I was really impressed by this because they left with, we left with four working prototypes of tools that can be used and developed to help those who are at risk of unlawful detention. Now, this was in 36 hours. And I just want to show you uh, a video of, uh, of me in interviewing an individual who was uh, behind one of these, um, these products here. Hopefully this will run. It's a really good video, honest. <laughs> What are we looking at? The Activate application that you know, allows you to capture photos, you know, instant or the one from the library or video or audio, but just made the photo for now. And you can take a picture of whatever happens. And you're going to see this, uh, going to use it and see it overlaid with uh, um, location information, which is no real time. Uh, well, not anywhere around it, just all the decimal places. And actually, you can go to another one, or you can you know, start uploading this. You know, you know, start uploading this picture, and while uploading, you can actually you know, look at what you're uploading. Whilst you're uploading, you can see the, all the kind of um, uh, metadata added into the, the image. Amazing. And while uploading, you actually can start describing, you know, what's happening there. So whilst you're uploading this, you're actually describing what's yeah, going on. Yeah, and it'll be another, uh, another no, uh, request to the server saying, I know, this thing is under upload, actually, you know, it's identified, you know, you have to description. So okay. no, you, you have time while uploading to, to write things. And I can you know, go back at the beginning and you know, do other one, or you know, the next will be, I know, to do the capture video properly, mm -hmm. which, uh, or, uh, no, the audio. And you, you built this in how, how long? One day. One day. But All just, it's one just day. HTML5 and JavaScript and using PhoneGap uh, APIs. So it's like two pages, they say two pages of HTML and one of JavaScript, like, you know, roughly estimated this size. Fantastic. Thank you very much. This is brilliant. Thank you. And my, my colleague Ralph, who's sat in the audience, was also on the team that helped develop this. So, uh, you know, round of applause to him and, uh, and the team. Um, Now, admittedly, it's only about 10% of the product that we need, and there are lots of, uh, lots of implications to this. There are lots of things that we need to consider, um, not least things like data security, anonymity, network stability, um, a whole manner of, uh, of, of things that we need to consider before this is a workable product. Um, but I guess I, I don't want to dwell on what's left to do, because I think that the real takeout here is what was done in, in a single day. Um, a single day of work, and there were three other prototypes that were created on that day as well. Now, that's pretty amazing to me because, you know, how much more amazing would it be if we could scale that up to, to several products over the course of several, uh, several campaigns, over the course of several years, and so on. Um, now, this was a pilot for Amnesty, but it's our intention to, to launch at least one of these four prototypes um, after, you know, going through that rigorous due diligence that we need to. Um, it's still early days, but you know we've, I guess we were so taken with that response that we, we intend to do it over and over again. Um, in fact, we aim to repeat this idea of using technology, using open innovation to develop technological solutions for social change until it becomes a core competence of our organization. Now in moving our organization closer to the ground, this is how we, we hope to meet these objectives. Uh, using technology, the whole idea of active participation. Uh, by definition, active participation requires that we, we broaden our model from that of observation to include intervention. A comparison between these models can be seen here. So the observation model, which is the one that Amnesty is perhaps more known for, is, uh, is one whereby, I guess through the rights holder, we were able to, to witness um, a human rights problem, for want of a better term. Um, through that community. We're able to, to send, in certain circumstances, a team of individuals to a country, to a certain place, where they are able to, to carry out research and come back with information that, is, uh, is, that relates to that specific human rights violation. 
We then work with the media to amplify that um, through their channels. Um, and then, obviously, using our own supporter base as a, uh, as a mobilization tool as well. Now, this is a you know, time-honored model. It's still very much used within the organization. It will stay. But what about the intervention model? So that differs because whilst the problem definition remains the same, a separate set of gears kick into action. So instead of media amplification, we take what is essentially an, an intellectual challenge to the development community, the talent, if you like. A community of stakeholders from a variety of backgrounds, including, crucially, those who are experiencing the, uh, the, the human rights problem head on. Um, the idea being to develop sustainable solutions that rights holders can reuse, can replicate, can, can use elsewhere, and hopefully own in their own right. Now, I want to make something categorically clear here, because in doing this, we, we will fail. Now, we will get it wrong, not exclusively, but we'll probably get it more wrong than we'll get it right. About a week ago, uh, whilst putting some of the fin finishing touches to this presentation, I came across a video online. It told the story of a, a young guy called Michigan Ingawale, um, who's uh, an Indian national living in Mumbai. And uh, he is a researcher, an entrepreneur, um, and he was struck by the level of maternal mortality um, that was uh, happening not too far away from where he lived in Mumbai. So he wanted to build something. So he created this thing called Touch B, which is a, a way of, uh, of measuring in media um, without actually having to take a blood sample. Now, he told the audience this, and the audience just rippled into applause. You know, they were really taken by the idea that this guy could build this. And then the punchline came. It didn't work. He built it again. Same thing. In fact, he built it 32 times in total before it did work. And with that hurdle out of the way, he now intends to eradicate anemia globally by 2020. That's his challenge. Now, we need to be more like this guy. The very nature of innovation demands failure. Um, it means that we'll be doing things that may never have been done before. And in this game, there could, of course, be risks. Risks in getting it wrong. Now, we obviously have to register those risks, assess those risks, um, and sometimes the risk may be too great to actually move ahead. But particularly in technology circles in, in Silicon Valley, there's a, a saying um, which is, fail early, fail fast, and fail often. It's a mantra that you hear a lot. And it's not a, a demotivational guide to life, but what it is is a, a simple statement that says the only way to stay ahead of the curve is to prototype rapidly and to commit to continual improvement. Going one better every time requires that you accept that the product wasn't at its best to begin with. The good news is that Amnesty has a lot of organizations out there that, who, who are willing to partner with us in order to get to that next stage. Um, there's no shortage of organizations who want to help us scale these ideas. Um, now, I guess we can tap directly into those individuals, but we also need to, to think about how to bring the expertise along from the likes of organizations who are perhaps better at doing this than we are. Now, the last point I wanted to make is that I guess the old global north, global south mindset is slowly becoming redundant. It's no longer relevant to think in terms of people over here helping people over there. We don't have the exclusive rights to privilege anymore. And nor do people in the global south own necessity. There's necessity right here in the global north. Now, we need to remember this, not least because the next 50 years of economic growth in large part belong to the global south. But perhaps more importantly, we don't want to be seeing responses like this. Whether you agree with this or not, whether it's justifiable or not, as I guess can be seen here, this was the response to the Coney 2012 video. More importantly, you know, there's an increasing degree of, uh, of human innovation capital coming from the global south, which is, I think, far more important. We need to be mindful of the fact that there's a significant degree of innovation coming from places that don't necessarily strike us as, uh, as innovative to begin with. But given that we know technology doesn't discriminate favoring bad or good or vice versa, the 
level playing field this creates for the human rights community, um, I guess, throws up an array of issues that we need to be mindful of, requiring us really to be cognizant of some of the risks and some of the big issues, some of the big ticket risks that are taking or that will emerge over the next 10 years. So bearing in mind what I said earlier, that you know, humankind is pretty bad at, at predicting the future, from today's standpoint, I envisage three things that I think we need to be thinking about over the next 10 years in terms of human rights. Firstly, we're entering an era of big data. I read a fascinating statistic the other day that we, as humankind, create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data, or around uh, 125,000 years worth of DVDs, back to back every day. 90% of the data we've ever created didn't exist before 2010, and that's growing exponentially. Now, corporations, strangely, have taken the place of government in terms of uh, the amount of mineable information that is available on an individual. Uh, in his book, uh, The Filter Bubble, Eli Pariser talks about uh, uh, an organization called Axiom, which is the world's largest processor of, uh, of consumer data. He calls them the world's biggest company you've never heard of. Um, after 9-11, Axiom were able to, to amass more data on the perpetrators than the, the entire government agencies uh, working for the US government, um, which is a, quite shocking when you think about it. But whether it's the likes of Axiom or whether it's information you freely volunteer via social networks or whether it's behavioral data that is surreptitiously gathered on your behalf, or even whether it's internet cookies or mobile phone networks and so on, big data stands to be a pretty major battleground for human rights campaigners over the next 10 years. And directly linked to this, of course, is privacy, which is the second battleground. Now, we hear a fair amount about the mission creep of uh, Facebook's privacy policy, um, but we hear markedly less about the unregulated permissions that are afforded to, to smartphone apps and the increasing number of job seekers who are being asked for their Facebook passwords at interview. Um, so that they can be checked out. Now, the good news is people are beginning to sit up and ask a lot of questions, which is you know, why uh, the people in SOPA Act were defeated quite recently. Yes, it's true that generations behind us do think, and will probably continue to think of privacy in a very different way to the people in this room today. Um, but uh, you know, interestingly, the, the visibility offered by social media, I think in the last week, has proved that um, Americans on their, uh, American students on their spring break have started to behave themselves a little better as a result of uh, the, the p penetration of social media. They simply don't want their parents to be looking in on what they're doing there, which is uh, quite an interesting one, I thought. And after, I guess, the area of privacy is the third area of concern which I'd raise, which is seamlessness, and it links, again, directly into the first two. Um, the ability to take our information with us wherever we go which, considering the first two, could have pretty massive implications as we relinquish quite I increasing amounts of data to the cloud or to the so-called ecosystems of the big four organizations, such as Amazon or Google or Apple or Facebook. Now, we can't get enough of this because it lowers barriers to entry. It helps us, if you like, to, it helps us with our internet experience. But at the same time, it's kind of worth remembering that it comes together you know, with an altogether more serious uh, connotation when the likes of, uh, of Google are saying that they want to market to us based on background noise from our mobile phones, for example, uh, and that they want to consolidate our wallets in the cloud. Um, things on the internet are never free, as we know. You know, we become the product over time, and I think that that's something that will, the seamlessness aspect married up with the, the big data and the privacy aspect will become sort of one of the three big things that we need to think about over the next 10 years. So, as civil society and technology become, I guess, closer together and begin to encroach up upon each other's heartland. It's worth remembering that this really means that we need to learn lessons from our own past and to think about reviving the idea of civil society as a social network. It means using technology to serve the needs of, of rights holders in the situation that we're highlighting. It also means uh, thinking about not only servicing our own needs as organizations, but how we, I guess, how we serve those of the individuals who are out there and who are thinking about necessity beyond what we're thinking about. So that's where I'll finish. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Owen. Owen told us to stand up and to question and to formulate questions. You now have the opportunity to quickly ask some questions to Owen before he has to leave for Berlin. Unfortunately, beaming hasn't quite reached uh, us yet, so he still has to take an airplane back. So do you have some urgent questions that you would like to ask Owen? If that's not the case, I would really like to know one thing. You know, we uh, concluded in our initiative that we don't actually need to reinvent human rights, but rather to apply them consistently. Do you think that's um, reflected in the practice of amnesty? So what's the, big, what's the big human rights challenge for amnesty regarding internet? I think one of the big human rights challenges is, is really thinking about the whole freedom of expression space and how we can bring to bear some of the, uh, I guess, the, the long-held beliefs that we hold as an organization and apply them to this space. The, the fact is that we need to work with organizations in civil society who are perhaps really quite skilled in this area, so individual organizations who have been working in this space for quite some time. But I think that what we can bring as an organization is that, that understanding of the, the corpus of human rights, um, I guess, beyond technology and how that needs to be applied to technology. And I think that's really quite crucial for, for us as, a, as an organization, but also as a, as a sector. Okay. One further question we've heard in our initiative. Oh, yes, there's one up there. I'm just curious. Thank you for your presentation. I'm just curious. Uh, your take on collectivism and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with regard on the one side having, uh, you know, creating petitions and uh, bringing in a bunch of new people, you know, not only through petitions and, and social media, Facebook likes and mm -hmm. Twitter followers, but at the same time, like, where, where's the impact? Where's the beef? Uh, how, do you, okay. how do you use them? Uh, you know, with the challenges that you probably have, uh, you know, bringing new people in the organization, converting mm -hmm. them as donors and so on. So wh where's the... Um, me, I think... Split there. Okay. I, I think it's important to have um, to present easy on ramps for people who are perhaps interested but not yet committed in our committed to our organisation. Um, I believe that there's a need for us to to graduate individuals and to move them up. I guess that that conveyor belt as we as we go along. So I, I don't believe in the term collectivism. I understand what people mean when they talk about it, but I think that it's. It's uh, an easy on ramp for people, giving them an easy way to get involved. It's then our job to, to cultivate that relationship and hopefully move them further up that, that food chain, if you like, to the point where they are willing to get out onto the street and demonstrate. Okay. We've heard in our initiative uh, that social media can be used uh, to further human rights, but also that uh, social media can also be used as a tool against human rights. You know, mm. neo-Nazi groups, for instance, use social media to uh, promote their uh, slanted worldview. Mm. In your practice, do you see that too? Or do you, see, do you think that still social media is more important as a tool to protect human rights than to infringe um, upon them? I, I think social media as a, as a tool doesn't care about positives or negatives, quite sadly. It's something that, um, you know, I, I guess a really good example would be um, the person who established um, a, uh, the meetup.com site, mm. yeah, you know, came from the at the John Kerry stable. Uh, he established that as a means of, um, I guess, getting people who are more left-leaning together to, to talk about, I guess, democratic issues in the United States. Ironically, the very same tool gave rise to the Tea Party movement. Um, so, you know, in, in many ways, the tools can be used in whatever way people see fit. And that may mean that um, they'll be subverted to be used in ways that, that aren't necessarily, uh, I guess, compliant with our own views. And by the same token, tools that we create may be used for, uh, for things that we didn't originally anticipate. And that's a, a risk that we have to take. Um, but I think that uh, over time, what you can do is to, to begin to educate people through technology and to educate people through uses of technology. But the technology itself is, is really a neutral. OK. And if you have uh, one final uh, message for us to take home for the experts of our initiative, what would that be? I guess to um, be mindful of the work that, that we do as people involved in human rights and make sure that we connect with the individual on the ground. I think it's very easy for us to lose sight of, um, of what is actually required by individuals who are still perhaps new to technology and still um, not really thinking about the, the broader implications of things like submitting a, a significant degree of information via social media, for example. Um, there's a, a I guess an understanding that we have to bear in mind that things are different and things are you know, constantly changing as a result of that. But 
um, in order to connect the dots, if you like, to bring the work that has been done today and over the last three months together with the, uh, the individuals who are on the ground, I think there's a need for us to, to sometimes, I guess, temper our language and to make that language uh, something that is, can be easily understood by the layman. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, let's give Owen another applause. Thank you so much.